Hey, good morning, church family. My name is Russell, and I'm one of the pastors here at Chinese Baptist Church of Miami. Uh, I'm so glad that you've decided to worship with us this morning. And even though it's online instead of in person, for many of you, I know you've already made up your minds, and the decision's already been settled that Sunday morning's worship takes precedent over everything else. And you know, you've made that choice because you know as well as I do that our decisions have consequences. Certainly, things like worshiping together and studying the Bible and spending time in prayer, certainly things like that have an effect on you and your spiritual life. But other things in our lives, other decisions we make, affect us as well. You know, recently there's been a lot of students who are contemplating what, what college to go to or what university to attend in the fall. Many of these students, they haven't even had a chance to see the campus because everything's been closed because of the coronavirus. But whatever decision they make, certainly that's going to affect their lives greatly. We also know that decisions like uh, who you marry or what career you take or what city you live in, all of these things can have a great impact on our lives as well. But it's not just uh, the big things. The little things make a difference also. Uh, for example, how often you decide to eat dessert, or even if you choose to eat dessert, that certainly makes a difference. How much sleep you get, uh, that, uh, that affects your body a lot more than you might think. How you spend your money, that matters as well. You know, you might think it's just a little bit here and uh, a little bit over there, but it all adds up. And the choices that we make of how we respond to the things that happen to us in life, well, those matter as well. They say life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you respond to those things. Well, we can't always decide what situations we find ourselves in, but we can decide how we're going to respond to those situations. Uh, listen to what the book of James says about this. He says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Our decisions and the way that we view things matter, especially the way that we respond to difficulties. So this morning, as we look into the Bible together, we're going to see how we should respond when we find ourselves in a crisis like we are now. I'm really excited to, to bring this message to you. So let's begin our worship service by singing some songs to God this morning. The words will be on the screen so you can sing along, or if you'd like, you can just reflect upon them silently as you look at the lyrics. Either way, I hope that these words express the attitude of your heart and your desire to worship God this morning. Let's begin with our first song, Raise a Hallelujah.
little louder Louder than the unbelief Sing a little louder
oh how he loves us and oh how he loves all right hey let's play let's pray together uh, before we look into god's word father god we thank you uh, god you are worthy to be praised even in the difficult times, even in uh, the times when we can't see what lies ahead. God, I pray that just as your word says, you give and you take away, but blessed be your name. God, I pray that would be the cry of our hearts this morning. God, help us as we look into your word. God, as we find ourselves in a difficult time, uh, in a very confusing time, God, help us to look to you, to trust you. God, to believe that you are who you say you are, uh, as we read in your word, and that you are with us, and that you haven't forsaken us. God, give us the courage to move forward. Give us the boldness to look to you, to walk with you in the good times and in the bad. And God, I pray that through all of this, you would be praised, and your name would be magnified above all. God, we pray these things in your holy and your blessed name. Amen. Hey, how many times uh, in the last couple of weeks have you heard someone refer to the uncertain times that we're living in? I know I've heard that phrase quite a bit, uh, and I think I've probably said it many times as well. Uncertainty really seems to describe the, all the craziness that's going on these days with the coronavirus, though, doesn't it? Especially if you think back to those couple of weeks back in March, where it seemed like everything was closing, and where it seemed like every day, uh, sometimes even every couple of hours, there was some huge and some new development going on. It really seemed like there, it, it was uh, hard to tell what was going on, and it really did seem like there was so much uncertainty in the air. But you know, I was reading something uh, a few days ago, a week or so ago maybe, and the author was talking, he was making the point that People seem to be using this term as if uh, in days past, in month past, as if those were certain times, as if they were reliable and as if we knew what was going to happen. But he said, no, you know, life has always been shaky. That's why we need Jesus as our rock-solid foundation for the good times as well as the bad. And I think that's a necessary correction to our vocabulary because We've never been in control. We never know what the future holds. And nothing really reminds us of that reality more than a crisis. Sometimes we face a crisis individually because of choices that we've made or maybe choices that someone else has made. Other times we face crisis uh, or a crisis affects a whole group of people and they had nothing to do with that situation arising. You know, what we're facing now Uh, is something that the whole world is experiencing. And us as a church, this is something that we're certainly all going through together. And there are some tough decisions to be made. Governments, businesses, churches, even families are trying to weigh their options, knowing that some of the decisions that they make, they're going to affect the rest of people's lives. But, you know, for Christ followers... One decision that shouldn't be hard to make in the difficult times is to keep following God, to keep trusting that he is still at work. We know that he is there, that he loves us, that he is here with us, and that he is working all things out for our good. And we can rest assured that we're not the first ones to go through a difficult or an unexpected time. Today, as we look into the Bible, we're going to look at an instance where the early church where they had their whole world turned upside down and where they were facing an unexpected crisis also. Uh, Let me give you a little bit of background before we jump into the Bible. We're going to be in Acts 7 uh, and 8 if you want to find your place. But here's what's been going on. In Acts chapter 6, we're introduced to a few people in the church who are assigned to help out with the ministry that's taking place in the church so that the apostles could focus more on prayer and more on teaching the Bible. Two of those men who are selected, uh, their names are Stephen and Philip. And we're actually going to talk and read a little bit about both of those in our passage this morning. But later there in in chapter 6, we're told that Stephen, he was uh, visiting with some people. And he was telling them about Jesus. 
And he was performing different signs and wonders and different miracles. And eventually, it drew the attention of the religious leaders. Well, they didn't really like what Stephen was doing and what he was saying. And so they questioned him. And in Acts chapter 7, there's a, a pretty lengthy speech recorded by Stephen where he basically tells the religious leaders, he says, hey, all throughout Israel's history, the people haven't listened to the prophets or the teachers or those people who were telling the truth about God and who were trying to bring people back to God and to his ways. And Stephen says, well, you all here in front of me, you're no different. Matter of fact, you're the ones who actually killed Jesus. That's why you did it. Well, as you might imagine, uh, that's not a good way to win friends and to influence people. And so here's what happens next. As soon as Stephen is done speaking, we read this at the end of Acts 7 and into Acts chapter 8. It says, At this, they covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed to him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul approved of their killing him. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house, he dragging off both men and women and putting them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria, and he proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Well, this is a turning point in the book of Acts for a lot of reasons. Uh, for one, here we see that the persecution against the church, it's been ramped up incrementally. We see that the, the persecution goes from some warnings to not to talk about Jesus, to people getting beaten for talking about Jesus, now all the way to Stephen being killed. Secondly, we see that everyone in the church is now affected. Previously, it was just the apostles who were warned and beaten and told not to, not to do this kind of activity. But now, it's everyone. And thirdly, we see that now there is just flat-out persecution. And we see that because of that, most of the Christians in Jerusalem, they have to leave, and they can't come back. So, in an instant, the church gathered becomes the church scattered. And nothing could have prepared them for this. In a lot of ways, I think you and I, we're kind of in a similar situation. We're kind of like the church back here in chapter 8. Just like them, you know, we didn't have a lot of warning before the bottom fell out of everything, and we found ourselves in the situation we're in today. We also see that this is a situation that none of us had any part in creating. And we also see that in just a, a short amount of time, everyone's life has been changed. Everyone's life as they knew it has, is completely different and can never go back to the way it used to be. And you know, another thing, just like those first disciples, another reason, another way that we're similar is just like them, now we have to choose how we're going to respond to this situation that we find ourselves in. Because when a crisis comes, the decisions we make, how we react, and how quickly we react, and what we tell ourselves, all of those things matter. And so as we look to the early church, and as we see the way that they responded to that crisis, I think that gives us a plan for what we must do right now in our crisis. So if you want to take notes, I have just a few things that I think will be helpful for you. The first one is this. In the midst of their crisis, First and foremost, we see that they continued the mission. Think about that for just a moment. Preaching the name of Jesus 
had gotten one man killed. And immediately afterward, people were uh, going through the city. They were destroying the church. And as best they could, trying to obliterate any trace of the church's teachings or the church's followers. And those early Christians, you know, they couldn't even shelter in place because people were going from house to house and they were taking them captive. They were throwing them in jail, if not worse. I mean, literally thousands of people at this moment, thousands of Christians had to flee the city in fear for their life. Uh, This situation was serious and and things had escalated pretty quickly. And while on the run, these new Christians, they had to decide what they were going to do. And their decision was to keep preaching Jesus. Uh, Put yourself in their place for just a moment. What would you have done? How strong would your faith be? You know, if preaching Jesus resulted in at least facing imprisonment, how eager would you be to keep witnessing or to be associated with other Christians? I imagine in these days, uh, before social media and before communication like we know it, uh, it might have been uh, maybe a little bit easier than it would be today to just go to a new town and to you know, start a new life and to try to put the past behind you as best you could. The church at this point was probably two or three years old, and so it wasn't like people had been associated with the church for their whole lives. Uh, maybe they, would, they could have just you know, taken it kind of easy and kind of flown under the radar for a while until things calmed down. But that's not what these early Christians did. In fact, it doesn't even seem like this thought even, even crossed their minds at all. Instead, I think they were probably thinking about the words and the teachings of Jesus. Things like, a servant is not greater than his master. And if they persecuted me, then they'll persecute you also. They probably thought of Jesus when he said, in this world you you will have trouble, but take heart because I've overcome the world. They probably thought of him when he said, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world does, so do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You know, earlier here in the book of Acts, the disciples, they, they stated that they must obey God rather than man. And then in a previous difficult time, they'd actually prayed for boldness to continue preaching about Jesus. Well, we read that their prayers were answered, and even though the, the difficult times persisted, they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for Jesus. I mean, think about what would make people carry on like this? Why would they choose to continue telling other people about Jesus, even though it was so costly? Well, it's the same reason that you and I and countless of other Christians throughout the centuries have. And that's because Jesus is worthy. As these Christians, as they were scattered all throughout this region, they fought to keep things going because they knew that the gospel is worth it. Jesus had empowered them to go forward, and even though it was different from anything they'd ever experienced, and even though they didn't know what the future held, they persisted, they continued with the mission of the church to love God, to love others, and to make disciples. Now, I read a story recently uh, about an old fighter pilot who was talking about how most of the the formations that they flew in, the, the planes were in groups of three, or six, or 12, maybe even 18. And he said that they flew very close together, which really wasn't a problem until they flew through clouds. Because depending on how thick the clouds were and how big they were, there could be entire moments where you wouldn't see any of the other planes flying around you. Needless to say, this could cause a a lot of anxiety when the clouds are full of 14-foot propellers that are spinning 1,800 times every minute. And so in those situations, he said that the, the inexperienced or the undisciplined pilot, he would be tempted to flee. He'd be tempted to do whatever he could 
to get out of that situation, to get out of the clouds, to, to get back to where he could see what was going on. But this man said that the most important thing to do when flying through those clouds is to keep that spacing and to keep that formation at all times. And he said, you know, to do so, you have to be in the right position before you enter the clouds. That way, when you can't see what's ahead of you, you just keep everything how it was. You don't climb. You don't slow down. You don't turn. He said, no, in those moments, you keep going just as you had been. And if everyone does that, he says, then they'll make it through. Well, you know, those first disciples... When they were scattered, when they didn't know what was going to happen next, they kept doing what they had been doing. And they stayed focused on what was the most important, which was telling people about Jesus and being the church. The devotion to God, the love for other people, these things that motivated these first disciples to keep preaching during the persecution, These are the same things, these are the same motivation that keeps us going during a crisis as well. Right now we're facing a time unlike any time that we've ever known. I don't think there's a single person alive today who's gone through anything uh, remotely close to this. And in the midst of this, though, we still have to choose to continue the mission of the church. Even though we're scattered just like they were, even though there's a lot of uncertainty about what's going to happen next. But one thing that's not uncertain, one thing that we know for sure, is that Jesus is still building His church, then that the gates of hell won't overcome it. And you know, if hell won't overcome heaven and won't stop the church, then neither will the coronavirus. Jesus is still at work. The harvest is still plentiful. And so there needs to be workers who will step up and who will keep working even during this time. Friends, we can't be distracted from our mission. We can't be paralyzed by the fear of the unknown. Although we find ourselves in a very difficult situation, the mission remains the same. And just like those first disciples, we can't slow down. We can't abandon our calling either. But while the mission remains the same, we see from this passage that the methods will have to change. It's been said before, methods are many, principles are few, methods always change, principles never do. In the midst of of their crisis, I think the early church recognized this as well. And that's why we see them, that's why they did new things. I mean, they knew their mission must continue, but how? Uh, They didn't have any homes to meet in anymore. And they couldn't meet in the temple either. Both of these were key places for fellowship and for teaching there in those early days of the church. Moreover, they were all scattered. And so even if they had a place to meet, they couldn't come together anyways. That meant there were no group times of prayer, no group teachings, no times to gather together and encourage one another. No times to share money or other resources that that the church had. I mean, in an instant, this crisis had taken away everything they ever knew and everything they had functioned with up until this point. But again, they knew that the mission must continue. They didn't see this as a time to retreat. They didn't see this as a time to, to turn inward and to only focus on themselves and just try to preserve themselves and what little they could grab. Instead, they saw this crisis as a time to innovate. They didn't get stuck in the past. They didn't long for how things used to be and thought, well, we've never done it any way different. We can't move forward. We don't know what else to do. No, we see that they used this crisis that they were in, they used it as a time to do things that they wouldn't have done otherwise. You know, there in verse 5, it says, Philip went to Samaria and preach the gospel. And to us, we're like, okay, um, he couldn't be in Jerusalem, so I guess he just went somewhere else. But you have to understand, this is a remarkable statement that the scriptures make. This was a revolutionary development taking place here. Uh, you can go and study, there's lots of different sources online and books and 
Bible dictionaries and things that can help you. But the Jews and Samaritans, they had this huge animosity between them. They went back hundreds and hundreds of years, and there were just numerous differences culturally and religiously. Uh, This despite the fact that the Samaritans were themselves half Jewish. But nonetheless, these issues between the two groups, uh, they could never be resolved. And so there was little interaction between these groups. I mean, it even got to the point that if an Israelite had to travel from Judea in the south, maybe Jerusalem or somewhere else, if they had to travel to the north, if they had to go to Galilee, what they would do, they would actually detour, they would actually go out of their way and add length to their trip so as not to go through Samaria. That's how much they really hated the Samaritans. They, they'd go out of their way not to even look at, not to even talk to these people. I mean, that's just how fierce uh, this uh, animosity was between these two groups. But, you know, in the midst of this crisis, as the church was scattered, they went to new people. They went to new places. And without the resources that they had grown accustomed to, they had to try new things. While staying focused on the mission, they didn't give up. Instead, they were flexible. They adapted to this new situation. And when we find ourselves uh, in a time of crisis, much like we do now, we must do the same thing. You know, for churches who, even just a few months ago, if their main focus was the, the Sunday morning worship gathering and just gathering and just bringing in lots of people together, well, we all know that's the one thing that's been changed the most over this time in churches. That's the main thing that's been affected. That's why none of you are here right now. That's why I'm preaching to myself in an empty room. Pretty quickly, churches discovered over these last couple of weeks that they have to pivot and they have to start doing some new things. Online services, online Bible studies, online giving, even ways of caring for members and doing business meetings, all of these things had to be retooled in a very short amount of time. You know, I even saw pictures a few weeks ago of a wedding that took place in a parking lot of a church with everyone spaced six feet apart uh, except for the bride and groom. Uh, and they, were, they did this so that they wouldn't all be gathered together into a crowded sanctuary. Uh, they got creative, they got innovative, And they did what they had to do. You know, this is a time where churches, we're really going to have to think and and operate differently. All the while remembering, though, that while the methods change, ultimately the message remains the same. And that is Jesus is crucified for the sins of the world and and that he's raised from the dead and that he'll welcome any who come to him in faith and repentance. He will forgive sinners who turn to him, any and everyone who calls upon his name. And so the message never changes, but the methods, well, they're going to have to change and fast. You know, like the early church, we must be willing to, to be innovative. We must be willing to try new things as a church, yes, but also as individuals. After all, a local church is made up of individual Christians who have covenanted together. And so if you're a Christian who's just been content to attend the Sunday morning worship gathering, well, that's obviously not happening anymore like it used to. And so this is a time for you to to be innovative, to think about what you can do to grow in your faith and in your walk with the Lord and to grow in your relationship with others. Certainly as a church, we're here to help you and we have resources and, and groups and we can help get you plugged in. But you need to think about, well, what can I do differently during this time? Uh, How can I challenge myself to to make some changes? How can I learn something new? How can I make progress in my walk with God, even during this time? Additionally, uh, what are some ways that you can grow in other areas? Maybe there's a new skill that you can learn, either professionally or personally. You know, a lot of people have a lot of extra time these days, and as we still can't really go outside or do participate in a lot of the activities we used to. And so 
maybe think what are some things that you can do now, productive things, to fill this time. Uh, maybe there's some work around the house that you can get done. Maybe this is a time where you can be intentional to spend with your family and to develop a pattern of, of family devotions. Maybe you need to, to do something differently during this time. Maybe what you need to do is recover that idea of a Sabbath and learn how to rest in God. You know, it's okay to take a break sometimes and to not always focus on, on productivity. Maybe this is a time for you to, to pick up a new hobby or look for ways that you can put skills that you already have to new use. You know, I was kind of laughing. I read a story a few days ago from NPR. Uh, they had a story about a Mexican wrestler who was out of a job because of the coronavirus, because audiences can't gather, no one can watch you wrestle, and so they had to close the operation down. Well, after a week or two, this man and his wife, they, they started getting kind of desperate because they couldn't buy food and they couldn't pay bills. And then his wife had an idea. She said, hey, you know, we make all of your costumes. If you've ever seen the, the, the Mexican lucadors, they have these elaborate costumes and capes and masks. And, and she said, hey, we make all these things in, in our house. What if we were to use our skills and to make masks for people? Uh, we're, there's a shortage, and I'm sure people would pay if they could have one. Why don't we start making masks? And so the man thought about it for a moment. And he agreed, as long as they had uh, a certain twist to them. And so they put their sewing skills to work, and now they're making over 200 masks a week. You can see there in the pictures. In fact, they said that business is booming, and there's more orders than they can keep up with. Now, that's certainly something uh, innovative, uh, but whatever you do, let me encourage you to be willing to, to do something different. Try new things at this time. Don't be afraid to, to fail because that's part of the, the learning process. You know, both spiritually and personally, let's not waste this time. Instead, when you look back one day, I hope that you'll be able to see God working in your life and I hope that you'll see good things coming out of these very days. As difficult and as dangerous as that time was for the early church, I'm sure sometime later they could look back. And I'm sure they could praise God for all that had happened during that time because they also saw lives changed. Because they were faithful to the mission, because they tried new things, they saw results that they wouldn't have seen otherwise. I mean, we read here, Samaritans who normally wouldn't have had a chance to hear the gospel, well, they respond in faith and they become Christians. We read here that lives are restored, that people who were sick or disabled, that they are healed. And we see that even in this darkest time of persecution and fear and uncertainty, we see that God is able to bring about joy in people's lives. I love verse 8. It says there was great joy in that city. Great joy that only comes from knowing God. And we know as we read through the book of Acts that this was all in the providence of God. As he had told them back even in chapter 1, he says that you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and all over, all to the ends of the earth. And this is exactly what we see happening here as the gospel spreads to Samaria. And as the church scattered, the church grew and the church triumphed even in the midst of a crisis. How will you remember this time? When you look back a couple of months from now, maybe a few years from now, maybe as you're telling this story to your children or to your grandchildren someday, how will the, how will the decisions that you made, what will they be characterized by? Will, you, will the decisions and the way that you viewed things, will they be guided mostly by fear, by anxiety, uh, by reluctance, or by joy, like we see here in verse 8? You know, there's certainly no easy answer to make this crisis that we're all in go away. But each of us can choose, and each of us are in control 
of how we'll respond to this time. And just as this was a critical moment for the early church, the decisions that we make during this season will define our lives and our church as well. Let's not waste this time. No matter what you're going through, no matter where you find yourself, don't miss what God is doing around you. You know, in Isaiah chapter 43, God is speaking to the Israelites. And I love this. In in verses 18 and 19, he says, Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. We believe in a God who can do remarkable things. He can make a way when there's no way. He can make streams flow in the desert. And he can bring good out of the darkest, now the most painful times of your life, even out of a crisis like we're in now. I believe that God is working, and that I believe he's going to do something new in our midst through this time. And I believe that he's going to continue changing lives, both ours as we follow him in obedience, and others as they come to know and to follow Jesus as well. And even during this crisis, we can experience God. We can walk with him as never before as we continue the mission that he has for us and as we try new ways to accomplish that mission. So let's take comfort during this time. Let's follow the example of the early church and let's not waste a crisis. Will you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for this wonderful example from the early church from the book of Acts. God, I pray that you help us to be bold just as they were. Lord, not to retreat when things get difficult, not to to cower in fear, but God, press on just as strong, just as bold as we had been previously. God, even in the difficult times, help us to know that you are there, that you are walking with us every step of the way, and that, uh, Lord, as you hold our hand and as you guide us, there's nothing to fear. God, I pray that you help us to, to use this time to not waste these moments that you've given us. Lord, the good times, the bad times, the painful times, we know that all of this is an opportunity for us to look to you, an opportunity for you to, to strengthen us, to refine us, to make us more like you. And so, God, I pray that you would help us to, to be bold, that you would help us to continue the mission, that you'd help us to try new things, to look for ways to reach others with the good news of Jesus, that they would be able to have the same hope that we have that gets us through the good times and the bad, the crisis, as well as the good days. God, we love you. We thank you and pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We have one more song that we're going to sing this morning. And so let's go ahead and sing this as a praise to God. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come? Sorrows 
concentrate and for joy From the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling Oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with The precious blood of Jesus Christ What a Savior, isn't He wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down before Him, for He is Lord of Christ is risen. Oh, what a Savior! Isn't He wonderful? Sing hallelujah! Christ is risen. Bow down before. Christ is risen. No, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Bear your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. All right, well, church family, just a few quick announcements. Um, we, uh, again, is if you would like to continue worshiping through tithes and through sending in your offerings, we have several different ways that you can do that. Uh, one way you see on the screen there is through the P.O. box. And so if you would like to send in a check, uh, write your um, envelope number on that. Uh, or you can send in the pink envelope uh, as well as your check. Uh, you can send that to the P.O. box that's collected weekly, and uh, that's secure and, and safe, and so you can certainly go ahead and, and um, send to that address. We also have online giving as well, uh, and so if you've done it before, uh, you know it's super easy. Uh, there you can see in the screen, up in the, the top corner, there's a box that will take you right to the, to the link, and you can go ahead and proceed with the online giving. If you haven't done it or if you're curious about how it works, you can click on the other box there uh, in the menu. And that gives you a drop-down menu, walks you through step-by-step. Step. Uh, it's really simple. Uh, it's really easy to do. And so um, if that's more convenient or if you're more comfortable with online giving, uh, feel free to, to go ahead and, and use that as well. We know this morning 
Uh, we talked about how these certainly are uncertain times, but you know they're really not any more uncertain than they were when the last time that we met together, or even compared to how things were a year or so ago. Our awareness of the uncertainty might be heightened, but the times themselves, they're always shifting. We're never in control, and we never have been. But when Jesus is our foundation, then we don't need to fear. When Jesus is our foundation in a crisis, we can continue on with the mission of the church, and we can continue on. We can look for new and innovative ways to further the mission of the church and to build God's kingdom here on earth. Let's not waste this crisis. Let's flourish as the men and women that God created us to be. Let's follow the example of the early church, and let's obey just as they did. And I'm sure we'll see the blessings and the joy just like they did as well. Church family, I love you. Uh, I'm praying for you. I miss you. And I hope that you stay safe and healthy until we can meet again. God bless you. And I'll come to the altar.